question. We're going to be in Mark chapter 7 again today. For those of you who are new with us, who, who are just joining us, we are preaching through the gospel according to Mark. And so today we find ourselves in chapter 7, verses 14 through 23. Verses 14 through 23. Once you have arrived there, um, if you are able to, out of honor for God's holy word, would you please stand as I read these verses? Mark 7, verses 14 through 23, read like this. And he called the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is expelled? Thus he declared all foods clean. And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. May God bless the reading and the hearing of his holy word. You may have a seat. If you've ever been disqualified from something, it's a humbling moment. Disqualification can happen for a number of reasons. Um, I'm going to tell you about one that I read about recently. This is a story out of London. A record-setting ultramarathon runner has been disqualified from her most recent race following allegations that she cheated by using a car for part of it. <laughs> Scottish ultramarathon runner, don't know how to say this name, Josia Zekruski, placed third in the GB Ultras Manchester to Liverpool race that took place on April 7th in the United Kingdom, but has since been disqualified following inconsistent tracking data that was taken during the race, according to officials. In an interview with the BBC, Wayne Drinkwater, the director of the GB Ultras race, confirmed that Zakruski had been disqualified from the race, from the interview. We can confirm that a runner has now been disqualified from the event, having taken vehicle transport during part of the route, Drinkwater said during the BBC interview. Now, what is more shocking, that this woman would dare cheat by using a car in a foot race, or the fact that she still placed third. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's never fun to be disqualified from something. But with disqualification in mind, listen to these words I'm about to read from Revelation chapter 21. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. But... Nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Uncleanness disqualifies someone from the presence of God for eternity. Uncleanness, the text says. And today's passage that we stood for deals primarily with being unclean, uh, being defiled. We have a group of people, the Pharisees and their scribes, influential people at that, who are convinced 
that the disciples have made themselves defiled. You remember, you remember last uh, Sunday, they've made themselves unclean, unfit for God's presence because of their failure to follow um, a ritualistic tradition. Dirty hands make for dirty people, so they say. But as Jesus does in our text today, he takes our misconceptions and he sets them on their head and he reveals God's very heart and will to us. So, so here's the question today. What makes us unclean? Uh, that's for the note takers. What makes us unclean? That's the question that the text answers. And again, I have to stress, I, I have uh, before, that this language of clean and unclean is a bit lost on us, uh, but would have been very familiar to Jews in the first century. To be clean is to be found acceptable, uh, um, permitted to be near God's presence in the temple and among God's people in the city. If you are unclean, you are not welcome in the temple. You are removed outside the city walls. So clean and unclean is a really big deal. So what makes us unclean? And, and isn't, this, isn't this the foundational question that anybody considering God should ask? If there is a God, and if that God is holy, he's, he's pure, He's undefiled, he's perfect. If that's who God is, and I want to be in fellowship with him, here's the question. What makes someone unclean or clean? The, the inverse. How do I become acceptable in God's sight? And, and what might prevent that acceptability from happening? What would keep me from being clean before him? So for this, this rabbi, who is the Messiah, to teach with authority, about what makes someone clean, to, to declare what makes someone unclean. That's profound, uh, this, because this is, not, this is not a fringe concept to, to their theology and their understanding. This is not uh, out, on, out, on the, uh, out on the side somewhere. Um, Jesus is talking about what makes someone acceptable in God's sight, and the opposite, what makes someone unclean and defiled in God's sight. So this, this matters. Church, this matters for us. We are not Israel living under the old covenant. That's absolutely true. But we are God's people. We are redeemed by the blood of Jesus at the cross. And Galatians chapter 3, verse 29 says, If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So clean and unclean still matters, rightly understood. Absolutely. Because being found pure, being found acceptable in God's estimation, that, that, that's our greatest need as human beings. It is. He's the one we were made to, to worship and to represent. We're, we're, we're meant to know God and to be with him forever. So what makes us unclean? There are three considerations from the text today. Three considerations that will help us. And the first is this. The first consideration you need to keep in mind as we talk about this clean and unclean business is this. The covenantal shift that's taking place, the covenantal shift. Now, I'm going to get to what that means in a moment. I don't mean for that to be confusing at all. But there is a covenantal shift taking place with the advent of Christ and with his work. But here's a foundational statement before we unpack that a bit. Hear, hear this. God determines what is clean and unclean. That, that's kind of foundational to this whole thing. God determines what is clean and unclean. It isn't up to you. It isn't up to me. Um, we don't uh, put it to a vote. God determines what is clean and what is unclean because God alone is the standard for what is pure, for what is right, and what is undefiled. So, so in other words, clean and unclean, that's not arbitrary. God determines that. These terms and concepts are, are articulated according to his standards. That's just kind of foundational that God determines these things. So with that in mind, let's jump Back in time, consider the Old Testament treatment of uh, these sorts of issues, okay? We have the law. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a little plug here. Tonight at the theology class, we're talking about the law of God. What do you, as Christians, what do we do with the law of God? We're talking about that tonight, um, as well as the, the nature and mission of the church. So tonight should be fun. But jumping back in time, we, we have the law that was given at Mount Sinai, you remember. And from that giving of the law comes all kinds of uh, 
case law. So not just the Ten Commandments, but man, how are, how are these Ten Commandments fleshed out in specific situations? But then you also get this ceremonial law, the rules and the structures for maintaining, um, maintaining an undefiled place and an undefiled people because they live with God in their midst. They must be pure. So you have all these ceremony and ritual laws that, that deal with that. And to maintain a status of purity, um, there were certain things that the people couldn't participate in, certain things they couldn't eat, specifically, is what's in view here, what goes into a person, you understand. Certain animals, uh, certain things they couldn't touch too, like dead bodies and, and stuff like that. This would make you unclean and unfit to dwell in the camp and be near God's presence. And Israel had lived under these rules for, for years. They, you know, they had abandoned them and rejected God and exile and all of that. But this had been in place for them for a long time. So that, that's their understanding. Jump back to our scene. Here is God. And guess what? He's the same God. He's the same God as in the Old Testament. And he's telling people that nothing outside of you can make you unclean. It's a matter of ability. These things cannot make you unclean. In fact, we uh, read, Jesus was here declaring all foods clean. So what is he doing? He, he is shaping our understanding of what truly makes someone clean or unclean in God's sight. Jesus is giving us that shaping. And while the restrictions for the people of Israel, they served, they served a great purpose to illustrate God's holiness to separate them from the other nations around them. Absolutely. Here, Jesus shows us this turning of a page in redemptive history. There's a covenantal shift taking place. In fact, if you came, uh, if you came to Sunday night class a few weeks ago, you'll remember, you remember this. We were talking about how God operates uh, with people throughout history, throughout the history of, in Scripture, by way of various but compounding covenants throughout history, um, with Adam, with Noah, with Abraham, with Moses, with David, and, and uh, all of these covenants of promise, as Paul calls them in Ephesians, they all find their culminating fulfillment in Jesus and his work as he ushers in the new covenant. So all of, all of the promises of God, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, all of the promises of God find their yes in Jesus Christ. So, it would be an error, I say all that to say, it would be an error to think that one day God woke up and, well, God doesn't sleep, you know what I'm saying, I'm being silly, he, and changed his mind, you know, he just lightened up a little bit. You know, I'm feeling generous today, I suppose, I suppose you can go to Red Lobster now and eat shellfish. <laughs> ah, why not? Let's just, let's just do away with that arbitrarily. No, 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 that, not at all. God is not, there's no shadow of change in him. No, the, the purpose of the covenants historically has been to find their greatest meaning, their greatest expression in Jesus and his work. They, they all anticipate him. So this concept of unclean and clean, that has carried God's people along to this moment when Jesus says, you've been waiting for the punchline, here it is. You, you, you want to know what's at the bottom of this whole clean and unclean thing? Here it is. And Jesus can say this definitively because he is the one who is going to bring an end to ceremony and ritual as it was known. So, so he has the authority. Through his fulfilling work, the sacrificial and the ceremonial aspect of the law would be fulfilled. Hebrews 9, for example, Hebrews 9 says that Jesus appeared once for all to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Romans 6 says the same thing. Hebrews 7 says the same thing. N no more new sacrifices. You're not going to improve upon what Jesus has completed. So all of the ceremony that anticipates him has come to an end as it was known. No more goats, no more bulls, no more rams, no more altars, no more buildings. Paul says he does not dwell in temples built by human hands. That, that has all reached a greater fulfillment in Jesus and his work. So Jesus is stressing what has always been true, what has always been anticipated, but now at this point it is plainly revealed that God's people are counted as his people because of an internal spiritual reality, not by an external practice or ritual or tradition. 
in Matthew's gospel, which, which has the same account, but it, uh, it includes some details that Mark's doesn't. In Matthew's gospel, the disciples couldn't believe it. It's like they couldn't believe what they were hearing. And in fact, they said to Jesus, they pulled him aside and said, Jesus, you know you just offended the Pharisees? They said, it, 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 was, it was a paradigm shift for these people. But it was going to get a whole lot bigger than just what food they could eat. And so Jesus is mercifully preparing them for something bigger that's coming. Certain foods were unclean, but you know what was really unclean to Jews? Non-Jewish people. The, the, the Gentiles, the surrounding nations were considered unclean. Okay? They are unclean in the sight of the Jews. And what is about to happen right after this scene? Um, you, we, we are allowed to do this. You may look ahead in your Bibles, and please do, actually. Look at what happens right after this. Verses 24 through 30, Jesus casts a demon out of the daughter of a Gentile woman. And they even have this conversation about, you know, I'm, I'm not a Jew and, you know, these sorts of things. But Jesus um, accommodates her anyway, a Gentile. In verses 31 through 37, Jesus crosses into more Gentile territory and he heals a man who can't hear and can't speak. And guess what? Super gross. He even touched his tongue in order to do it. More uncleanness. And then, while he's still among the Gentiles, he performs another miraculous feeding of 4,000 of them. Three profound, dramatic scenes of Jesus going to the Gentiles, going to historically unclean people. How? How can that happen? Because our understanding of what truly makes someone acceptable in God's sight is being clarified by Jesus. And, and we have to listen to him. Do not call unclean what he declares clean. F food was just the beginning. That was just to plant the concept in their mind that things are taking a giant step forward. And in case you're thinking, boy, boy, this sounds like God changing his mind a little bit. Uh, first, first, one day the Gentiles are unclean and now they're okay. Is, isn't that inconsistent? Well, no, the, the gospel starting with Israel and then going out to the world was always the plan. Amen. It was always the plan. I'll give you a couple of examples. Psalm 22, um, which Jesus quoted the beginning of on the cross, um, says this toward the end. The, the rest of Psalm 22 is, is good too, by the way. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. I could also refer to you Isaiah 11, verse 9, Isaiah 25, verse 6, 45, verse 22, 51, 4 through 6, Micah 4, Psalm 2, 72, 110, and so on and so forth. This prediction that this is what the gospel is going to do. It's, it's not going to stay restrained to, to a size of land that's roughly, uh, roughly the distance between Missoula and Billings. It's, it's not. Sorry, Bozeman and Billings, even smaller, if I'm remembering right. It's going to go to the earth. That's always been the plan. And the time for realizing that covenantal shift is now. Everything in history has been working up to this moment. In Acts 26, even, Paul says, my paraphrase, hey, this is nothing new. Go, go read Acts 26. The plan was always that the gospel would go to the Gentiles. This is this is the reality of the promise to Abraham. Remember that all the nations would be blessed by his seed. God meant that. And, and so that promise, Galatians clarifies for us, was looking forward to Jesus as the seed and the worldwide effect of his work. This was always in the cards. So th this covenantal step forward, th this is just one consideration from today's text, but it begs a question or two for us. Are Am I saying that now, because Jesus has come, does that mean that, you know, there's no more rules and rules don't matter anymore? That we can disregard everything God said in the Old Testament? Not at all. Not at all. Am I, am I saying that? Not in the slightest. How we think about the Old Testament and, and God's law matters tremendously. And again, in fact, we're going to cover that at tonight's class. I invite you, even if you haven't been before. 
we don't get to live however we want. <laughs> Let me just, if that's a kind of a hope in the, oh, wait, does this mean? No, it doesn't. We don't get to live however we want. That is not the point. The point here is this. There is more to being clean or unclean. There is more to it than ritual or ceremony or bloodline. And that is because of Christ. Jesus turned that page into this new covenant era and we must follow him there. The, the, the old rituals are not enough. We cannot trust in them to cleanse us. Why not? Point two. Consideration number two, the truth of the heart. The truth of the heart. First, first was the covenantal shift, and second point is the truth of the heart. This is our second consideration. Again, the people of Israel were called to abstain from certain foods as a picture of their purity and their separation from the other nations. And so uh, even today, if, uh, serious religious Jews to this day will abstain from certain foods with dietary restrictions and shellfish and pigs and, and a host of other things. You can uh, you can look into that further. But what Jesus says here is shocking. It, it, as I said, it's a paradigm shift uh, for many, certainly, but, but it really shouldn't be. And, and, I'll, and I'll explain that in just a moment. Eating certain foods does not defile you, he says. He says that in 15. He says it again in 18. That's not what makes you unclean in God's sight. Those things have served as an expression of the people being set aside. But the true issue is not whether or not uh, the animal you're eating right now ever chewed its cud. That's not, that's not the issue. What is the issue? The things that come out of a person are the issue. They are what defile him. We, we have to drill into this a little bit. He says this in verse 15 and again in verse 20, while alone with the disciples, reverse your thinking, not what goes in, but what comes out. So, so the big idea here is one of origin. Uh, it's, it's where something comes from. I hope you see that. Re reason this out. There's food out there. You know, there's uh, meat, uh, bread, whatever. It comes from without. You take it in. You ingest it. It passes through your body, and that's that. But it didn't come from you. It, it started out there. It started somewhere, somewhere else. But there are things that do come from us. This is Jesus' point about the heart. Looking again at verses 20 and 21. What comes out of a person is what defiles him. For, for from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, envy slander, pride, foolishness. Horrible, defiling things come from, where do they start? They come from within a person. They, they aren't on the outside and you accidentally bump into them and suddenly I'm defiled. They start in you. They begin in the human heart. The most atrocious things in the world begin inside of people. This is something Matthew Henry said that I, I thought was helpful. He said, as a corrupt fountain sends forth corrupt streams, so doth a corrupt heart send forth corrupt reasonings, corrupt appetites and passions, and all those wicked words and actions which are produced by them. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. You know that from Jeremiah 17, 9. And we could say, oh, it's not that bad. Jesus is just having a bad day. He's exaggerating, is he? What, what sorts of things originate in the human heart? We're, we're given a list. Let's go through it. And it's okay to squirm. <laughs> Evil thoughts. Your hate and your vitriol and your scheming and your bitterness all come from you. Sexual immorality, that, that encompasses a lot. It's essentially everything outside of intimacy within covenant marriage. Casual sex, pornography, uh, different perversions, that all comes from you. Theft, whether it's money, property, or someone's immaterial resources like time or reputation, those sins come from within you. Murder, and, and lumped in with murder, hatred, Jesus says, that comes from you. Adultery, so violating the marriage bed. Coveting, this is greed, never having enough, never having enough. Wickedness, there's a good catch-all in case we miss anything. Wickedness, anything opposed to God and his agenda. Deceit, so intentionally leading someone away from the truth. 
sensuality or lasciviousness, being sexually provocative, envy, or, or literally sin of the eyes, uh, um, seeing and desiring something that you are not meant to have, whether material or status or whatever, slander, no one's ever done this, intentionally damaging someone's character with your words. That comes from you. Pride, thinking far too highly of yourself. That starts in you. Foolishness, living with no fear of God before you. That starts in you. All of these evil things, the text says, come from within. And they defile a person. They come from within, meaning you can't blame another. And they defile a person, rendering them unfit for God's presence. So, church, here is the center of what makes someone unclean. The state of their heart. The state of their heart. The real issue is one of deepest desire and allegiance and agenda. God is after your heart, not your appearance or your empty external piety. There's lots of cleaned up folks that are dead inside. This is why Israel was, was given the law, certainly, but also not just given the law, but they were told to be circumcised in their hearts. Interesting concept and language. External signs of the covenant are meant to be an outward symbol of the reality of what's going on inside. That's why that language of being circumcised of the heart applies. Where is your heart before God in heaven? And you know this, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on what? The heart. The people of Israel, steeped in tradition, steeped in rule-keeping, needed this wake-up call. I, I would wager to say people need it today. Your cleanness is an issue of the heart. And by the way, human hearts are generally not too clean. See, see the above list of atrocities, if you've forgotten already. Now, now there is hope. There's, there is such a thing as a clean heart. We'll get there in just a moment. In the closing point, there is hope. But at this point, just, just pause and think with me. Two ways that I think this meets us today. First is to stop blaming the devil for your sin. Stop it. If you are. I don't know if you are, but if you are, don't. Look, look Satan and, and evil spirits are real. Of course they are. They are active. They hate us. They hate our God. They oppress. They interfere. They torment. They cause damage. Of course. But it is false to lay the blame for your sin on Satan. In fact, there was a, a Middle Ages scholar, simply by the name of Bede, who said this, this is an answer to those who consider that evil thoughts are simply injected by the devil and that they do not spring from our own will. He can add strength to our bad thoughts and inflame them, but he cannot originate them. Your sin comes from you. No, no one makes you do it. No one makes you do it. No one forces you to sin. You do it and you do it willingly. I do it and I do it willingly. We are more than capable of creating disasters all throughout our lives and throughout the lives of those around us while Satan takes a nap. We're, we're more than capable. That's what our hearts are capable of. When there's sin in your life that, uh, that, that leads to hardship or adds to hardship, if your first impulse is to blame the devil or someone else for that matter, stop in your tracks and remember what your own heart is capable of. Entertain the thought that maybe, just maybe, this sin originated with me. I, I, I need to repent. I need to seek forgiveness. I need to put the flesh to death. I need to stop blaming others. That's, that, that's the first point of application there but the second is this be honest about yourself be honest about yourself come to terms with this friend if you're thinking boy this is harsh but it's just if you're thinking that there's any good that originates with you expel that thought expel that thought there, there isn't now if we are christians we are seen as good because of christ it's true Absolutely. But, but that's not based on our merit. That's Christ's merit placed upon us. People in their natural state are not basically good. And to say that people are basically good and, and that we're all okay, that is one of the biggest lies you can perpetuate. 
One reason I believe that people don't come to faith is because this is not said to them. If, you know, hey, hey, um, Jesus loves you needs to be preceded by you are sinfully wicked and by no rights of your own should be in God's presence. It, 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 it must be preceded by that. That's where the gospel starts. Uh, with, with people's sad, lost state in need of a savior. Jesus loves you. Well, of course he does. I'm pretty lovable and grand, aren't I? No, <laughs> you're not. And, and, and that's the point. You need to go back a step further. You are created by a God to whom you are accountable. And your heart produces atrocities that are seen as crimes against this one true God. If there is any hope for you, a sinner, it is on God's terms and based on his very real goodness, not your imaginary goodness. That's where there's hope. So, friend, don't be deceived yourself and don't shortchange people when you give them the gospel. You know, Jesus just wants you to have everything you want and have a healthy life and whatever. That's that's nope, nope. Stop that. Give them the full gospel. Don't leave out the crucial part about their sin which makes jesus great salvation so great and necessary the most loving thing you can do for a lost person is to help them come to terms with their sin if i could put it in a sentence the most loving thing you can do for a lost person is to help them come to terms with their sin and from there we show them we show them the great hope that we have from there and that's my last point the last consideration here the hope of the gospel Here's where Jesus is seen as glorious. These people have had their worlds turned upside down by what Jesus is saying. Don't you know you offended the Pharisees? They've been told that simply following ritual does not save them. It does not make them right with God. And on top of that shocking realization, they're told that, by the way, your own hearts are what defile you. You make yourself unclean well enough on your own. Boy, that, that's a sour note. And it it would be if there was no hope. Jesus here is delivering the bad news, but Jesus himself also is the good news. He's the solution. Nothing, Nothing improper, nothing wicked or vile or untrue was ever produced by Jesus's heart. Think about that. You, we don't have enough time in the day, the week, or our remaining years to talk about what our hearts are capable of. That, that, that's atrocious before God. We don't. Nothing improper or wicked or vile or untrue was ever produced by Jesus' heart. Both in word and in deed, Jesus only ever produced righteousness in his life. Think about that. This is great news for people. Great news. And here's why. Because Jesus, who alone is pure and righteous because he is truly God. He would stand in the place of the wicked. He would stand in the place of the vile. And he would stand in the place of those whose hearts are set against God. He would go on to stand in their place. He would take their punishment and his righteous life would count for all who trust in him for their salvation. His, His pure heart would speak for the shriveled human heart. Remember... This story doesn't exist in isolation, right? N- nothing in scripture does. It's part of the bigger story of what God is doing to exalt his son and to save a people throughout the centuries and all over the globe. So Jesus says these words about the human heart with, with the cross, the empty tomb, and his glorious reign in mind and in view on the horizon. That, that's coming. So Jesus knows the sad state of mankind. Of course he does. But he also is God's timeless plan to bring redemption to people. And through the salvation that Jesus brings, guess what? Among uh, uh, many other amazing benefits, God grants us, among other things, a new heart. What, what scripture says a circumcised heart, a heart of flesh, Instead of a heart of stone, Ezekiel says. And with that heart, we have a new allegiance to a new master. We have a fresh desire to obey as we continually seek for our will to be aligned with God's will. 
an astounding transformation all accomplished by the work of Jesus Christ. So give thanks indeed. He gives us a new heart. Now, friend, hear, hear this as we end today. That there's hope for the one with evil thoughts. There is hope for the sexually immoral. There is hope for the thief. There is hope for the murderer, the adulterer, coveter, wicked, deceivers, licentious people, enviers, slanders, prideful, and fools. There is hope for the sinner, not because their hearts are pure, but because God's heart is soft toward them in tender mercy. That's why there is hope for them today. Jesus has ushered in a new and better covenant, an everlasting covenant sealed with his own blood, which was poured out for the salvation of many. And so we trust in him. We trust in his heart and not our own and not our own ceremony or anything else. His purity and his cleanness speaks for us. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm going to end a bit differently than I ever have. And I hope that's okay. I was really struck by what I'm about to read this week. If you're unfamiliar, there's a book called The Valley of Vision. And it is a collection of prayers, excellently written prayers. That uh, A collection of Puritan prayers is what it's known as. And um, it's just a, a phenomenal resource to have. I often don't have good words. <laughs> and, uh, but boy, some people have articulated some sent sentiments and affections toward God that um, are just helpful to read through. And there is a prayer entitled Heart Corruptions. And it's exactly what we're talking about. Our, the corrupt state of our heart and what God has done for us in Christ. And I thought it fitting to end today. I'm just going to read this prayer to you. And, and then we'll pray ourselves. So just hear these words from, uh, from the Valley of Vision. O oh God, may thy spirit speak in me that I may speak to thee. I have no merit. Let the merit of Jesus stand for me. I am undeserving, but I look to thy tender mercy. I am full of infirmities, wants, sin. Thou art full of grace. I confess my sin, my frequent sin, my willful sin. All my powers of body and soul are defiled. A fountain of pollution is deep within my nature. There are chambers of foul images within my being. I have gone from one odious room to another, walked in a no man's land of dangerous imaginations, pried into the secrets of my fallen nature. I am utterly ashamed that I am what I am in myself. I have no green shoot in me nor fruit, but thorns and thistles. I'm a fading leaf that the wind drives away. I live bare and barren as a winter tree, unprofitable, fit to be hewn down and burnt. Lord, dost thou have mercy on me? Thou hast struck a heavy blow at my pride, at the false god of self, and I lie in pieces before thee. But thou hast given me another master and Lord, thy son Jesus, and now my heart is turned toward holiness. My life speeds as an arrow from the bow towards complete obedience to thee. Help me in all my doings to put down sin and to humble pride. Save me from the love of the world and the pride of life, from everything that is natural to fallen man, and let Christ's nature be seen in me day by day. Grant me grace to bear thy will without repining, and delight to be not only chiseled, squared, or fashioned, but separated from the old rock where I have been embedded so long and lifted from the quarry to the upper air, where I may be built in Christ forever. Let's pray. God in heaven, we thank you. Um, we thank you that in our sad state of having defiled hearts, uh, we thank you that you have provided salvation through Christ, who was completely undefiled. He was only pure. We thank you that we're granted new hearts, hearts of flesh, when you save us, uh, we're so grateful for that miracle. And so, so, God, as these truths do go from our mind and seep down into our hearts, I pray that they would change how we, how we think and live, um, that we would, we would go straight after the hearts of ourselves and after people, Lord, um, that we would understand nothing from outside defiles. It is the heart that defiles. And, God, I pray that we would be bold and courageous in, uh, in confronting sin as our root problem. I pray that no one would be under the illusion 
that they are okay before God in their natural state, but that they are in desperate need of Christ who stood in their place and who earned righteousness for them. So God, simply please strengthen our understanding of the gospel and what we must believe and what we must communicate to others who are in desperate need of a new heart. Uh, We love you, Lord, and uh, we ask that you would accomplish these things for your glory and for the good of people. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.